Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to show you two different ways that you can draw on top of your video inside of DaVinci Resolve. So, the two ways are annotation mode, which allows you to draw notes onto the screen, but without actually showing up in the final video. So they are solely there for the editing process. And then the other option when you actually want to change the video output is to use a paint node on the Fusion page. So let's go ahead and start with annotation mode inside of the edit page of DaVinci Resolve. So if you look at the bottom left hand section of your preview window with any clip enabled, with any clip on the screen, then you can click down here and there is a viewer overlay drop down menu. By default it's going to be on transform, but the mode you're looking for is annotation. So you need to click on the drop down and go to the bottom. So when you switch to annotation mode, there's going to be some new icons that appear at the top of the screen. So here you have the freehand pen stroke tool, an arrow tool, a line tool, a rectangle tool, and then a color selector. So all of these are pretty much straightforward. With the color selector, you can select the color that you're going to want to draw onto the frame in. And then you can use the stroke tool in order to draw freehand. So with that, you can pretty much draw onto the screen. And you may notice that as soon as you start drawing, it's going to give you an indication of a marker being created in the top left here. And you'll also see it pop up in the timeline. So whether this appears on your video clip or on the exact point in time in the timeline depends on whether you have the video clip selected or not. So if you want to create an annotation onto the timeline rather than the video clip, the difference being that a marker on the video clip moves with the video clip, then deselect your video clip and then go to a frame in the timeline and do exactly the same thing. So this time we'll draw an orange and I'll just draw along the path of this river just to make a random note. So you'll see now that the marker appears in the timeline above here. So with these markers, you can double click on them if you need to give it additional information, such as river note here, and you can add additional text notes. You can also change the color of the markers. So purple, for instance, and then that'll be reflected in the timeline. And the thing to note about this is that all of these annotations are frame specific. So if I hit left and right arrows on the keyboard to go one frame before one frame afterwards, all of those notes disappear. So they are specific to the frame you are creating. So just to quickly go through the other annotation tools, using arrow literally creates an arrow for pointing at something on the screen. You can use the line tool when you need to draw a straight line. Rectangle does exactly what it says as well, creates a box somewhere onto the screen. And with any of these annotation notes you create, you can left click on them in order to change the color. So if I click on the drop down and change this to white, now the line is white. And lastly, you might notice that there is a drop down menu for this freehand stroke tool. So you can left click on a stroke and click on the drop down menu and you can choose a line thickness. So if I want to make that uh, line along the river thick, then I can click on the bottom option there. And then you'll see that the thickness of that line is much higher now. It also applies to any further strokes you draw in the future. So now for the second option the paint node where you can actually draw onto the video where it's going to be included in the export. So if we select our video clip and go over to the Fusion page, we'll be able to add some nodes to it in order to edit it. What we need to do for this basic setup, media in, media out, is to add a paint node in between it. So all you need to do for that is to have media in selected in this node graph editor at the bottom, and then click on paint, which is the fourth node over from the left. So that'll create our paint node. And you should notice in the preview window that you get a bunch of paint tools that you're able to use. So we have the selection tool when you want to select previously created elements. So the second option that you have here is called multi-stroke. So so multi-stroke is going to be the same as regular stroke. So let me demonstrate regular stroke real quick here. So so regular so the regular stroke option is basically where you use the brush, but as soon as you let go of the mouse button, the next stroke you create is going to be a separate element on the screen. So if I do a stroke here, I've created stroke two. If we go over to the modifiers and the inspector, you'll be able to see all of these items that I create. So as soon as I do another stroke, it creates another modifier. So all of these exist as separate objects. If I use the selection tool, I can left click on them you, and you can see the line that I created where the brush was applied to. When you have them selected, you can move them around individually using these gizmo tools that 
pop open in the preview window uh, as long as you're looking at the paint node. So when you're using these paint nodes, go ahead and click on the uh, right preview circle right here so that it pops up over here and that you have the right controls. So with these individual strokes, once you've made them, you can go ahead and change settings on them, such as changing the thickness or whether it has softness on the edges or not. So like so, you can also change the color of the stroke, whatever you need to in the future. And then down here at the bottom, you can control whether it is going to show up on all frames or for a set duration. And then down here at the bottom with stroke controls, you can control whether that stroke is going to show up for the entire video clip or for a set duration, a limited duration um, in terms of frames. So if you set it to limited duration, it's going to disappear on the following frames once the duration runs out. But if it is on all frames, then it it is going to appear all across the clip. So anyway, back to talking about multi-stroke. So multi-stroke, when you want everything to show up as one item, one modifier over here on the right, then with multi-stroke, and I will change the color in order to demonstrate this, you can basically left click, do your thing, and then create another stroke. And no matter how many strokes you create for this multi-stroke, it's gonna show up as one multi-stroke option. Uh, one of the differences though, is that you can actually change your brush type, the size, the color, and it will still show up as part of the multi-stroke. So what you do to one stroke in a multi-stroke does not necessarily apply to everything here. So now going back to selection mode, if I left click on one of them, you'll notice that all of them are selected at once, but there's no gizmo for moving the strokes around. So as far as I've seen, you can't actually move or edit any of the multi-strokes once you have created them. So I can't change the setting here for the size of the multi-stroke to apply to all of the strokes inside of that multi-stroke, but rather the settings only apply to further ones that you would create. So as far as I've seen with multi-stroke, you can't really change any of the settings on it after you have created your individual strokes. It's more or less once you have finished editing a multi-stroke, you can really just go into it, right click it and delete it if that's what you want to do to get rid of all of them at once. But with the individual strokes, you can change them freely. So that might be why you would want to use individual strokes over a multi-stroke, unless you just want to do everything at once and minimize the number of modifiers that show up on the right over here. So hypothetically, let's say you went in here with the stroke tool and you created a whole bunch of separate strokes, right? So eventually it's gonna get out of hand over here on the right hand side. And at some point you might wanna have all of those elements selectable. Maybe you wanna delete it later on or to change something about it. So what you can do is you can select all of those strokes individually, and then you can click paint group here on the far right. And then that is gonna take all of those strokes and put them under one group. So if you want to show those individual strokes again, you can click on show subgroup controls, and then that will show them all up here. But if you want to hide them because it's, you know, too many modifiers, then you can hide show subgroup controls. Also, because they are all under one group, you can change the settings here for the paint group. So if you want to move them all at once, you can either use the gizmo over here for the paint group, move them on the screen. You can also change the angle or the size scaling of all of those elements all at once. So paint group is handy when you want to take a bunch of elements and have them be edited as one single object. Maybe you're trying to draw some kind of character onto the screen. So if you ever need to move them all at once later on, or you need to change the size scaling of it, or you want to delete everything inside of that group all at once, it can be kind of handy. And you don't have to leave it named paint group one, by the way, you can right click it and go down to rename. So we could call this red shape or something like that. And you know, give it a little bit more information about what is actually inside of that group. And then of course the ungroup button, if you ever want to just get rid of the group, you can just return it back to a bunch of individual strokes. So what I'm gonna do here is actually just select all of these and hit delete, get rid of everything on the screen. Let's delete this extra stroke and the paint. And now we have a blank canvas again. Okay, so next tool, clone multi-stroke. So it basically works like multi-stroke, except now we are setting a part of the screen where we're trying to copy information from. And you do that by using Alt and left click to set this X as basically the copy reference point. And then you find another part of the screen where you wanna copy that same information over to. Right now it's gonna be copying those blue clouds. So whenever I left click and hold down, it's gonna be copying the same information, tracking the X. So basically those clouds over there on the left are gonna appear over here as a layer on top of everything. So it's a clone tool 
that allows you to also multi-stroke. So just like with the multi-stroke tool, you can do it multiple times and it's all part of the same modifier. So if we go over to modifier, you can see that it's all included as this one clone multi-stroke. However, like before, it has the same drawbacks of the multi-stroke and that once you have created it, uh, you really can't move it around. You can't change the brush controls for already created strokes. So if you mess up for some reason, you might need to delete it and recreate it, but not really a huge deal. Okay, so next tool, the polyline stroke tool. So this is really similar to something like the pen tool out of Photoshop. What you do is you create uh, basically points that are connected by lines with each other. So if you left click, it's going to create a point and you'll notice that there are these Bezier curve handles here. So it does not need to be a straight line. And I keep left clicking around here. Now note that right now we're in clone modes and the apply controls for the modifiers. I think I might be using the same reference point from before. Before. But if we want to change this to a normal line, then we want to click on fill and have the line fill with the color instead, which would be probably be the more standard way. Now, um, as I was trying to mention, the lines do not have to be straight. So if you want to create a curved line, then when you left click your next point, drag it around and you'll see this Bezier curve be created kind of a computer generated line and then it gets stroked across that line. And you can also click on old points and change the curve handles if you need to adjust them. This allows you to create a much more interesting shape than just a simple line. Though, obviously, as soon as you start using the curves, it's going to get a little bit messy and it might be hard to get the exact shape you want. But anyway, you can basically just keep going. Uh, you don't necessarily have to connect it to the start to finish it, but if you want, you can do that. So now that this is all connected, we can select this and move it as one object. I mean, it's already selected, so we don't need to go into select mode. I think it actually switched back to select mode automatically once we had uh, finished it. But now we have the gizmos where we can move these pin lines around the screen where we need them to be. And uh, obviously there's different modes for brushes. If you want to edit the shape later, you can also left click anywhere along the curve if you want to add a point. So basically clicking there, dragging it around, creates a new point with additional handles for adjustments. So you can create as complicated of a line as you want it to be really. Now, if you want a simpler shape, you have circles over here pretty self-explanatory. You left click and you drag and you create a circle with hard edges. With the circle selected, you can adjust the size of it at will. You can adjust the position. Note that those are being reflected over here as well. And you can change the color of it. So whatever you need a perfect circle, that's going to be handy. You also have the rectangle tool, very similar. Basically same idea, but instead you're creating a rectangular shape with four corners. Right, let's, I'm accidentally creating additional rectangles. Make sure that um, when you uh, create a shape and you want to go edit it, that you actually switch back to select mode. So then you can select it properly rather than accidentally creating an additional modifier. So now we can uh, adjust the width and height if we want. Um, you can change the position of it and you can change the color of it. Okay, now for when you want to create uh, basically shape lines, but without immediately filling them in with a color or complete fill. Okay, so the next three tools that you have available for you are copy, uh, copy polyline, copy circle or copy ellipse, and then copy rectangle. So the basic idea is similar to the clone multi-stroke, where you generally want to copy one area of your clip to another area. So if we click on copy polyline, it allows us to create lines with the same Bezier curve handles as before. So it can be a more complex shape than just straight lines. And if we connect that all together, we're able to take that copy polyline element and go over to copy polyline. And there is an option here for source. If we adjust the source position, it's going to change the information that gets copied into here. So if we adjust the source down or upwards, we're going to be copying from a different part of the screen to fill in this area. So that's the typical use for the copy polyline. But another option I found is to actually use the copy polyline to draw a perfect fill shape for you to fill this area in with, with a solid color. So with the polyline stroke tool that we were using earlier, I haven't seen a way to just fill it in with a single color. Uh, there may be a way. But if you want to do that with the copy polyline tool, you can just take this fill type and you can change it to fill. And now instead you're filling it with a color. So if we change the apply mode down here to color, then we can select a color to fill the shape in with. 
So I can go down here to blue and fill that in. So the next two tools basically work the same way. Copy ellipse, same idea, but we're drawing a circle. And uh, because we have the settings in fill, it's just going to be filling the circle, but we can make that an image instead as well. So if you want it to copy an image from your screen, change the apply mode back over to stamp. And then I believe we need to set the source output. So the next two tools are basically the same thing, just with shapes. So copy ellipse, if we draw this onto the screen, it's going to create an ellipse onto the screen. It doesn't need to be a perfect circle, of course, and those are editable. So I think it's doing fill because we had the polyline in fill mode. But if you want to change that over to the copy mode, then uh, make sure you select your copy ellipse one that you created there. Don't accidentally create another one. Change the fill type back to image, and then you need to change the apply mode to stamp. And now you can select a source import for that to fill in this ellipse with. And of course, if you want it to actually fill in the circle, then just do the reverse. Go back to apply mode color and fill type as fill. So just to quickly demonstrate with the rectangle over here, let's go ahead and draw a shape. So with this copy rectangle, we can change the source material. We can change the source position to control what's going to fill in there or we can change it back to fill and then apply mode color and select a color for it to fill that box in with. So the next option is fill when you don't have a shape that you want to fill in, but you actually want to just apply it to a background. Um, and it's gonna do this by filling by color. So let's actually just delete this paint node, get rid of everything and then add a new one in so that we're working with a blank canvas again. So with fill tool here, we can select a color like so and then we just need to click somewhere that we want to fill in with a specific color okay when you create your paint node make sure that you actually make it the preview window as well so that it's going to show up here on the top and then you can go over to the fill bucket you can select a color so let's just grab a green here and then select the area on the screen with a left click that you want to fill in with the color. So the amount that it's going to fill, basically the extent at which it takes this color and it keeps going with it, is going to be based on your range and your range soft edge. So the range is going to be what width of color variation you will accept before it stops filling in. And then the range soft edge is going to be controlling kind of the smoothness on the edge here. Uh, as it tries to blur with the rest of the background. So let's select another area and do another fill here. I'll increase the range by a bit and also increase the range soft edge. And then let's left click one more time. And you can see now that the amount that this filled in is quite massive. We made it a really large range. So the percentage of colors which are being accepted here by this range are very large. So it took getting up here to these yellow colors in order for it to exit that range. So when we left click and it fills everything in, you might notice in certain areas that there's a lot of this blurring with the range soft edge. So if we redid the fill with no soft edge, then you'd see down here that it is just, uh, it's very sharp. It doesn't have a little bit of fading going off of these edges, but rather it either fills it in completely or it doesn't at all. So that's the difference there with the range soft edge. Now you can see that when you are applying the fill to basically a complex video scene or an image or a photo, that it does not fill very well because there's just so many colors going on. It's not like a simple shape that you drew in Photoshop or something. So when you're applying the paint node to video, I don't think that there would be too many direct uses like this for that. Instead, I'd probably use tools like the copy polyline when you just want to fill in a specific area with a specific color so that you can get nice hard edges on that uh, rather than trying to fill in the background itself. But if you do need it for some reason, that tool is there as well. And I think that pretty much covers all of the tools that exist to you with the paint node in DaVinci Resolve. So, so now if you stuck to the end, you know how to paint onto an actual video frame using paint nodes in the Fusion page. But you also know how to do the annotations in the edit page for when you just want to draw a note onto the screen for video editing purposes specifically. So that's going to pretty much cover it for this video on how to draw and resolve. I've been Chris. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys in my future video content.